So we officially begin our, our first uh, panel session of the morning, and uh, we have two speakers, Neil Stirrett and Alain Gagnon. I think that they will be speaking for about 20 minutes each, yeah, around there, and then we should have um, uh, time for questions afterwards. So, Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I think both Elaine and I are um, a bit intimidated by following Peter Russell. <laughs> uh, that was a wonderful presentation, Peter. Really appreciate it. I want to recognize the um, Aboriginal people of Alberta on whose land we are here. And I want to recognize the various peoples from the various governments who participated in the uh, 1980 or the patriation and who made the time to be here. I think it's just incredible that some of the gaps that existed uh, have, are now being filled 30 years later. As I prepared for this, I had to sit back and, or sit down and think, well, I can go on my memory, which may be very faulty, or I can do some research. So I decided I better do some research. And there were so many gaps in uh, even though I was involved in every constitutional conference after 19, uh, November the uh, 3rd to 5th, 1981, there were gaps leading up to that and even thereafter that we didn't know because they were held behind closed doors. So what I, want, what I, what I ended up doing, it was quite frankly quite a challenge to prepare for this uh, because what I was asked to do was to talk about um, what, were, what, what were the dynamics after uh, November the seventh, or November the fifth, 1981, and I realized that I really couldn't talk about that unless there was some understanding about what went on before. And you've got some of that from Louise, and you've got an awful lot of that from uh, Peter Russell. Um, but I want to go back through it from an Aboriginal point of view and try to uh, let you know why we did some of the things we did after. Uh, leading up to and after November the 5th, 1981. Uh, so, the history of government relations with Aboriginal peoples across Canada from colonial times through most of the 20th century was turbulent. Although treaties had been negotiated with some Aboriginal peoples, successful federal governments failed to honour their treaty obligations and denied the existence of Aboriginal rights and title. At age 15 in 1956, I sat on the floor of a Vancouver hotel room listening to Native Brotherhood of British Columbia leaders of the day, Johnny Clifton, Harold Sinclair, Guy Williams, later Senator Williams, and others, while they discussed Aboriginal issues. What they said to me, sitting there listening, was, go to school, get an education, so you can help us settle the land question. Today we know the land question is Aboriginal title and rights. Those Aboriginal leaders trusted that the Queen could and would settle the land question. They had no reason to trust the governments, provincial or federal, to do so. The Native brother had a, a, a lawyer by the name of Thomas Hurley as legal counsel. His wife, Maisie Hurley, was a prominent activist for Native issues at the time. Maisie, whom I knew, founded the Native Voice in 1946, one of Canada's first Aboriginal newspapers. I think Tom Berger, who graduated from law school in that same year, 1956, either articled or worked with Tom Hurley. Organizations similar to the Native Brotherhood, its leaders and allies existed in all other provinces. But where would our future leaders come from, the ones that they wanted to carry on the fight? You might be surprised at the answer to that question. Each September while I was growing up in northwestern BC, the Indian agent sent my childhood friends from Hazelton and surrounding villages to residential schools in BC and Alberta. They were the children or grandchildren of elders like those who mentored me in 1956. The treatment they got as students in residential school compounded their anger and mistrust for government and its agencies. After leaving residential school, many of them held leadership positions on band councils and tribal councils beginning in the mid-1960s. The Pearson government was elected in 1963. In 1965, Indian Affairs Ottawa ordered its Quebec regional office 
to, org to organize province-wide meetings with the leaders of Quebec's Indian bands. Ottawa needed to Ottawa needed regional Indian organiza organizations with which to discuss repeal of the Indian Act. Shortly thereafter, Max Groslouis and Andrew Delisle founded the Indian Quebec Association. The government had similar discussions across Canada, and by 1968, tribal councils similar to the IQA were a growing force for their member bands. At about this time, provincial and national umbrella organizations were also being founded. The NIB, the National Indian Brotherhood, and the Native Council of Canada were established in 1968 to replace the National Indian Council, Council which was failing. The Inuit Tapirit Canadami in, uh, was also founded in 1971. When Jean Chrétien announced the white paper in 1969, Indian organizations existed to respond to it, but not in the way the government expected. Within a year, for example, the IQA rejected the white paper, claimed 85% of Quebec territory, and demanded $5 billion in cash settlement. Status Indians feared they would be left to the exclusive jurisdiction of the provinces if the government implemented the white paper. Jean Chrétien's announcement galvanized Aboriginal people to action throughout Canada. The fear of provincial jurisdiction over Indians and their lands was real. Tom Berger wrote that it has always been the provinces that have abused minorities. For example, Manitoba took schools away from the French in the 1890s, Alberta restricted the sale of land to the Hutterites in 1944, and Quebec imprisoned dissenting citizens in 1970. As Berger said, the issue of Aboriginal rights is the old and oldest question of human rights in Canada. At the same time, it is also the most recent, for it is only in the last decade that it has entered our consciousness and our political bloodstream. The emergence of Native peoples as a political force in the 1970s occurred because of initiatives that Indians, Inuit, and Métis all over Canada have taken themselves. One thing is common to all of these initiatives, the idea of Aboriginal rights. Tom Berger put those views to the test when he argued the Calder case on behalf of the Nishka. The Calder decision in the Supreme Court came down in 1973, which led to the federal land claims process and funding to conduct research and prepare for negotiations. The problem with this process was that a land claim settlement would lead to extinguishment of Aboriginal rights and title. This was unacceptable to us. And government attitudes still hadn't changed in BC. In 1975, for example, a BC Aboriginal Affairs Minister said to me, just because a bunch of Indians wandered up and down the Rocky Mountain Trench for a few hundred years doesn't mean they own it. In the decade after the White Paper, Aboriginal leaders locally, provincially, and nationally focused more sharply on Aboriginal rights and title issues, politically on the ground and legally in the courts. They made themselves heard through confrontation and blockades against hydro projects, logging and mineral, oil and gas development. In the 1970s, several delegations met with the Queen in Canada and England. In 1973, Harold Cardinal gave a political speech to the Queen in Alberta, and the Queen responded. In 1976, Treaty 6 and 7 leaders on the 100th anniversary of their treaties traveled to London and met with the Queen. In 1979, after Trudeau excluded First Nations representatives from its February FMC, the National Indian Brotherhood made plans to petition the Queen directly. The Liberals, not wishing to have the monarch intervene, invited the NIB to have ministerial talks, but would not include them in First Minister's conferences. A liberal invitation to the conferences came just before the May 1979 federal election. The liberals were defeated, and the Clark government was elected. Clark intended to proceed with FMCs, rejected the idea of having the NIB participate as an 11th province at all discussion tables, but contemplated having Indian representatives speak on matters that have a clear legal impact on Native peoples. NIB President Noel Star Blanket responded, we are not willing to accept exclusion from debate on a matter simply because it affects everyone in the country and not exclusively Indians. Nor can we accept the idea there can be an arbitrary separation of Indian issues on the one hand and non-Indian issues on the other. <clears throat> 
The Inuit were also concerned about their interests being disregarded during the 1960s and 1970s, long before the November 1981 FMC on patriation. Inuit leaders, before a special committee of the Senate and House of Commons in 1978 to draw attention to their concerns. In sept September, excuse me, in September 1979, the Inuit Committee on National Issues was founded in Igloolik to represent the Inuit on a national level with its main role being to coordinate and represent Inuit views on the Constitution and reform process. The Inuit, along with the NIB and NCC, were offered observer status at the Clark government's FMC in February 1979. Clark's government lasted nine months. After his re-election in March 1980, Trudeau again set out to patriate the Constitution. Harry Daniels, Native Council of Canada president, expressed his frustration at a meeting with a minister subcommittee in the summer of 1980. Daniels was puzzled at how this form of our participation in the constitutional review process has come to pass and why we are being asked to com comment on a list of priority items distilled from over two years of federal and provincial meetings and negotiation from which we have been excluded. Trudeau convened a federal provincial meeting of ministers in September 1980 without our participation. At, the, at that meeting, there were widely different visions of Canada and those negotiations and failed. Then, Trudeau then moved to circumvent the provinces by going public and meeting with various sectors, including Aboriginal leaders. Trudeau reached out and op offered observer status to Aboriginal representatives, including the Inuit, at the September 1980 conference. <clears throat> in October, the Union of BC Indian Chiefs reviewed the federal government position and concluded that the Indian peoples of Canada would lose their Aboriginal rights should patriation occur. And then the Constitutional Express was set up, and I won't go into that to save time. Uh, Louise covered that very well yesterday. Um, but at the same time, Aboriginal leaders in Manitoba were organizing. They asked that the Manitoba reference case be expanded to include the question of the requirement of First Nations consent. The court refused, but the Four Nations Confederacy of Manitoba participated as an intervener, taking the position that if the province succeeded in defeating unilateral patriation, it would be helpful to First Nations. By this time, other groups were alarmed. On December 15, 1980, for example, the Nishka made a presentation to the Special Joint Committee on the Constitution. Given all that was happening provincially and, and nationally, Nishka President James Godinell's presentation to the committee crystallized the issue when he declared, the history of our people since the first white contact is the history of our struggle for recognition of Aboriginal title to our lands. Our people are resolved to carry this struggle on until the Canadian nation, your parliament, the courts, and your people see fit to justify, justly settle our claim to the ownership of our lands. The ICNI also attended those hearings. Trudeau had proposed Section 25 Charter Rights and Freedoms without a derogation clause. The ICNI and Makovic said this is not good enough and talks went round and round. At the end of the day, the government capitulated and agreed that Section 34 would be added during the spring 1981 FMC. The ICNI remained skeptical, even while Jean Chrétien later assured them that Section 34 was safe. Aboriginal leaders and their advisors and their government counterparts labored over the language that would be included in the Constitution. It is difficult to know who the author of Section 34 was or whether there was a single author. Nevertheless, in a little more than a month, on January 29, 1981, the session Special Joint Committee recommended the following clause be included in the proposed Constitution, that the Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. In the spring of, so what happened in 1981? Aboriginal political dynamics and outcomes. In the spring of 81, the NIB, UBCIC, and leaders from the, throughout Canada accompanied the Constitutional Express to Europe. There the delegates presented their case uh, to the various countries. NIB had a full-time lobbyist in law, London since 1979. UBCIC and the Federation of Saskatchewan Indians also had full-time staff there as well. Uh, during the summer of 81, women from communities across B occupied the black towers of the Department of Indian Affairs in Vancouver for 10 days. 
They demanded an inquiry into the deplorable living conditions on reserve. That news made the London newspapers. The Prime Minister was well aware of the damage a well-orchestrated Aboriginal lobby could do nationally and internationally, but still refused to include Aboriginal leaders in the November 81 conference. When the conference closed on November 5th, all the provinces except for Quebec had agreed to a package of reforms. Section 34 was not there. Who was responsible? Doug Saunders wrote, there was immediate confusion. Chrétien said the section had been dropped because the Indians had objected to it. Prime Minister Trudeau said seven provinces had opposed it. Mr. Broadbent understood that the Prime Minister had supported the removal of the section. A journalist reported that Trudeau had asked if Aboriginal rights had been omitted by mistake. When told it was not, he shrugged and moved on. What dynamics were set in motion? After having worked for an international minerals exploration company for 10 years, I left the company in 1973 and moved home to northern BC. I knew little then about the Prime Minister's agenda, but between 1973 and 81, I was immersed in land claims, Aboriginal rights and title, and related political issues. I set up the Tribal Council's Land Claims Office in 1977 and served as Land Claim Director until 1981. The Gixan Wachodian Tribal Council held its annual convention November 5th to 7th, 1981. I was elected president on Saturday, November the 7th. The NIB called for an emergency meeting. I flew to Ottawa with, Nish with Nishka leaders James Gosnell and Rod Robinson and their advisor Don Rosenboom on November 9th. We learned upon arriving in Ottawa that the Inuit had met with the Prime Minister earlier that day. Trudeau had expressed regret that Section 34 had been dropped and suggested that he would restore it for the territories where the feds have full jurisdiction. Charlie Watt refused on the basis it was unfair to the other native groups. Watt suggested a three-year period to give time for the governments to negotiate specific provisions spelling out Aboriginal rights. The Prime Minister said if the Aboriginal people could agree on proposals, Cabinet would consider them. Aboriginal leaders submitted proposals to Cabinet. They were considered and rejected on November the 12th. The second betrayal led to widespread anger. This second betrayal led to widespread anger, protests, and occupations. The NIB declared November 19th National Indian Solidarity Day. In Vancouver, we occupied the UBC Museum of Anthropology, and 5,000 Indians demonstrated at the provincial legislature in Edmonton. Aboriginal anger at the government's duplicity led the premiers to reverse their position. I won't go into the details there. I'm getting the yellow sign here. Um, and I, have, I want to finish uh, the paper. So all nine provinces agreed to the new wording, and John Critton argued that the addition of the word existing did not alter the meaning of Section 34. Canada's Aboriginal peoples were about to embark on an unprecedented journey into the complex world of constitutional reform. Given the circumstance, it would be a short and steep learning curve with many twists and turns along the way. During our November 11th meeting, National Chief Del Riley set out the NIB agenda, which included preparing for a possible meeting with the Prime Minister, develop a political accord with the ICNI and NCC leaders. Um, the NIB delegates agreed to the NIB proposal and to developing a political accord. Um, only the Métis National Council supported the new Section 34 language. The Inuit, who had supported the government from January 30th to, 30th to November 5th, were now opposed. By November 19th, 1981, three national organizations, the NIB, the NCC, and the ICNI, ICNI were fully opposed. After spending time in Ottawa the week of November 9th, it was obvious to me and others that there were serious challenges to overcome, logistical, political, and legal if we were to be successful in the constitutional talks. But I thought the process had potential, basing my thinking on the problems we faced on the ground at home. There we dealt with government bureaucrats and conservation officers who were doing their job, some with greater zeal than others. We rarely got to meet with policymakers, and when we did, our presentations were ignored. In addition, a growing number of fishing and hunting related court cases taken by federal, provincial or, federal or provincial conservation officers threatened by precedent to undermine our rights. The constitutional process might overcome these problems through what I consider to be structural changes. That is, 
With Aboriginal rights entrenched in the Constitution, federal and provincial political agendas would have to change, legislation would follow, and bureaucrats would be required to follow resulting policy. On January 20th, 1982, uh, Fred Walkley, uh, Regional Director of BC, phoned to brief me on a proposed meeting Senator Jax Austin would be holding at the Ministry of State office in Ottawa. The Prime Minister would recommend that the Aboriginal leadership organize for round two of constitutional talks and commit to hold an FMC on Aboriginal matters within a year of patriation. The government budgeted uh, just over $2, $2 million for the national and territorial organizations, 600,000 to the NIB, NCC, and Inuit each, and 200,000 for the CYI, Council of Yukon Indians, and Northwest Territory affiliates. The Assembly of First Nations. Since 1968, patriation and the potential elimination of the Indian Act led elected band chiefs to become more involved in national issues affecting their communities. National Chief Del Riley and other leaders concluded in London that the NIB, which represented the PTOs, provincial territorial organizations, had to be reorganized. The NIB, unlike the other national organizations, had an enormous logistical problem. In 1981, the status Indian population numbered 292,700 on and off reserve from 577 communities. In comparison, the Inuit numbered 25,400, non-status Indian 75,000, and the Métis 98,300. In other words, the NIB spoke for 60% of the Aboriginal people of Canada. The NIB leadership had a series of meetings on reorganization and the AFN with a potential membership of 577 elected chiefs was founded. The baby was born but had yet to walk. In the new organization, tribal, answers, tribal council leaders could speak but not vote. That was okay because band councils had always delegated certain responsibilities to their tribal councils. Band councils dealt mainly with local issues, housing, capital works, etc., but they delegated broader issues like land claims, fishing and hunting rights, and Aboriginal rights and title to their tribal councils. Creation of the AFN was therefore an important development. It created the opportunity for all status and treaty bands in Canada to have an official say in national Aboriginal issues during its annual assemblies. The, the AFN took direction from and was accountable to 577 elected chiefs. There's 600 and some odd now, but uh, 577 then. Practically speaking, it would be impossible for all 577 chiefs to be intimately involved in constitutional talks. Tribal council and PTO leaders would assume that responsibility. Having organized, at least since 1975, around land claims research and negotiations, many tribal councils had the experience, the resources, and technical staff to deal with the internal and external challenges inherent in the constitutional process. Finding common ground. On December 1st, 1981, Grand Chief Ed John phoned me shortly after returning from Ottawa. He had attended a two-day NIB meeting with leaders from across Canada. It included the NCC and the ICNI. Second day of the meeting lacked quorum. Ed, Ed felt the meeting was disorganized and he had the impression that the NIB favored the treaty agenda over the title and rights agenda. Treaty Indians, especially those with numbered treaties on the prairie, strongly defended their treaties on the basis that they, that they were constitutional documents. Treaty leaders saw the FMCs as an opportunity to clarify their treaty relationship with Canada as well they should. The Aboriginal rights side included groups from British Columbia, the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Ontario and Quebec who were involved in land claims. We knew our communities were nations with laws and traditions, economies and governing structures before contact and we wanted to ensure protection for these values. The contrasting treaty Aboriginal rights agenda agendas within the AFN were apparent and of concern to others. Jim Fulton said the NIB and NCC, given their large treaty base, were not in a position to represent the rights and title interests in Northwest BC. Fulton recommended that we develop a cohesive definition of Aboriginal rights for presentation at an FMC. 
<clears throat> we also knew that we couldn't afford to have weak Aboriginal rights cases lost at the Supreme Court of Canada and that we would need to quickly articulate a response to the re large resource development projects tar targeted for Northwest BC. In a meeting at home, Gixan Elder Peter Williams framed the issue for both sides, Treaty and Aboriginal, when he said, this is a national matter and will apply to everyone uniformly. Therefore, everyone should use one voice to get Indian rights into the Constitution. If only one group tries, not much will be accomplished. I used that as my mantra as I continued on. I'm just two pages. Another interesting dynamic developed around the Indian Act itself. It turned out that some First Nations were strongly attached to it and feared losing it. This surprised some of us, but reinforced our need to educate not only the provincial governments in Canada about our issues, but also some of our own constituencies. North of 60, Aboriginal leaders weren't alone in their efforts. The CBC reported that the rights issue in the Northwest Territories is not just an Indian issue or Indian land claims. It is the one opportunity we as Indians and non-Indians have to ensure we, as Northerners, can have a say in Northern development. Although NIB meetings included Aboriginal women, some of them were elected leaders, Aboriginal men don dominated the debate. Some in the AFN argued that collective rights trumped individual rights. This placed the NIB in the contradictory position of seeking equality within Canada, but struggling to explain why sexual equality didn't exist within our, within our own societies. Define before we sign. Thank you. Uh, the NIB officially became the AFN in the summer of 1982, and First Nations elected David Ahenikiu as their national chief. Given its size and complexity, Edward John, Grand Chief of the Carrier Secondary Tribal Council, and I, and others, still had concerns about whether the AFN would be ready for the 1983 FMC, and about how we would go about educating the Premiers and Prime Minister about our Aboriginal rights, title, and self-government. We realized after several meetings that many Aboriginal leaders were interested in participating, but given the distances, uh, were often unable to carry out the work that was needed. At the same time, the NIB had capable technicians, but more would be needed. We weren't alone. Gary Potts, chief of Bear Island in Ontario, and George Erasmus from Yellowknife had similar concerns. George was very busy as leader of the Dene Nation and delegated Herb Norwegian to work with uh, Edward, uh, Gary and I. The four of us sought to bridge the gap between AFN leaders and officials and the PTOs and tribal councils. At the same time, government officials insisted that we define Aboriginal rights, title and self-government in concrete terms, which gave rise to the catchphrase, define before we sign, Professor Janine Brody mentioned Thursday evening. Our effort to educate the governments met with mixed success. The AFN agreed I would develop a presentation for a Winnipeg officials meeting on how Northwest Coast societies functioned in the past and today. During the presentation, some officials could barely hide their boredom. We didn't give up. A few days before the 1983 FMC, Edward John and I arranged a half hour meeting with BC's Attorney General, Alan Williams. We hoped we could get through to him. To our surprise, the leading the meeting lasted more than an hour. On the eve of the 1983 FMC, I struggled to reconcile mixed emotions. On the one hand, a new gener generation of leaders was finally meeting with the highest levels of government to address historic wrongs. On the other hand, it was very sad to know that the elders that had encouraged many of us decades before never got that opportunity. The conference opened with high expectations on our, on our part. During a key point in the meeting, as our table delegates tried to explain what Aboriginal and Treaty Rights and Title meant to us, Alan Williams signaled the chair. Williams took the floor and explained in his own words, Aboriginal Rights and Title, much as we had discussed a few days before. Needless to say, Edward and I were surprised. And by the way, it was Alan Williams who had told me in 1975 that just because a bunch of Indians wandered up and down the Rocky Mountain Trench doesn't mean they own it. The reason I raise this is we should never give up on trying to educate people. Alan Williams understood and became part of the BC Treaty process, designed it in BC, so we should never give up on anyone. We just have to keep on trying. So, two 
The 1983 FMC ended with a commitment to three further FMCs on Aboriginal matters. Grand Chief Billy Diamond, in particular, was pleased that treaty rights include rights that now exist by way of land claims agreements or may be so acquired under Section 35 because it gave treaty status to the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. The empty box. Considerable debate centered on what Section 35 meant. The Aboriginal view was that it was an empty box and therefore meant little. Moreover, we found during meetings leading to that FMC that many government officials and ministers were defensive and skeptical. During the FMC, some premiers were skeptical too. This reinforced our belief that Section 35 would remain an empty box if we only relied on political goodwill of the first ministers. Shortly after the 1983 FMC, Edward John, Gary Potts, Herb, Herb Norwegian and I began to strategize about how to deal with the empty box problem. We eventually agreed on the need for a court declaration that Aboriginal rights and title, rooted in our laws, traditions, economies, and governing structures, was needed. Risky as it was, we would rely on our elders and the courts to give substance to Aboriginal and treaty rights and self-government, because we believed the First Minister were unable and unwilling to do so. And that is how we came to file the written statement of claim in Delgamook versus BC in the Smithers Court Registry, October 24, 1984. That decision in 1997 determined the nature and extent of Aboriginal rights and title in Canada, recognized the validity of oral history, and generally gave guidance as to how to reconcile Aboriginal matters with provincial and federal policies and development initiatives. The rest is history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, for that history. Um, we have uh, until 10.45 for this session, so I'm going to hold questions for Neil until uh, Alain is, is done. And um, it's then my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Alain Gagnon to the, uh, the podium. Alain is a uh, professor of political science at uh, UQAM in Montreal. He's also a Canada Research Chair in Canadian Studies and Quebec in Canadian Studies. And last year, he was awarded uh, a Trudeau Fellowship. I uh, can't go through all of Alain's uh, publications. He has many, many, many of them. He is the founding director of um, the Interdisciplinary uh, Center for Research on Diversity, as well as the director of the um, research group on uh, plurinational societies. Uh, his most recent books include uh, a 2010 book with Michael Burgess on uh, uh, federal democracies, and I see there's another called A Case for Multinational Federalism, and then while Alain was sitting there, I see that there's yet a new book on uh, L'Age de Incertitude. Um, please join me in welcoming Alain Gagnon. Well, good morning, everyone. It's obviously a pleasure to be in Western Canada. Uh, my connection with Western Canada goes back to 1976, where I did my MA at Simon Fraser. And I frequently return in this side of the world because I really appreciate the weather, the sense of humor, and the hot personality, summer and winter like. <laughs> um, in the fall of 1981, I was at Carleton University register in the PhD program. And my intention was to write my dissertation on regional development. And I wanted to and only work on regional development. I'm an Eastern Quebec born citizen. And I felt that we had that in common with people in the Atlantic region. And that we needed to find better ways to accommodate each other. And I find that now in the Constitution, which is to some relief to me. Now, Little did I know that after some years, my, my field of interest will shift, although I did complete my, my PhD on regional development, I then realized that my, the claim and my demands would be much more important to do if I were to get invested, invest my time in, constitutional, in the constitutional arena, and that's what I've done, even if some of my colleagues at different universities, McGill in particular, do not appreciate all of my position with respect to the Canadian constitutional development. Writing a joint paper, and this is a joint paper, uh, is like writing a constitution. My co-author is uh, a Newfoundlander. 
is not directly connected with the premier, the former premier that we heard yesterday. He is uh, a non-nationalist and a non-separatist. Whereas Mr. Pickford at least is a nationalist, definitely in the Canadian sense. Uh, and Alex Schwartz is his name, is doing now a postdoctoral degree, a postdoctoral fellowship at Queen's University, uh, where he received a Benting Scholarship. Now there are four reasons that kept us together wanting to complete this project. First of all, our desire to challenge dominant textbook material. And we heard a lot about that yesterday and in the years before. This morning, I think we started on a different ground with Peter Russell. The second reason was a respect and understanding for each other's position. Now, this is something that you should always have in a constitution. The third one is believe that the country's federal tradition needs a serious boost. And fourthly, faith in the future of Canada so that the page we are writing is more just for all of its inhabitants, starting with the first inhabitants, and with Quebecers. So the title is Evaluating the Condition of Canadian Federalism Since Patriation from Recognition to a Federalism of Empowerment. Now, in a somewhat controversial manner, we hope to show the extent to which the Constitution Act of 1982 did not diminish or eliminate federal conflict in Canada. If anything, it contributed to open old wounds and to undermine federal practices, contrary to what we heard yesterday uh, Mr. Goldenberg stating. As will be illustrated, I hope federalism has lost some of its qualities on at least three fronts over the last 30 years. Rather than being flexible, federalism has become more rigid. Rather than being multivocal, federalism has become gradually univocal. Rather than being responsive, federalism has turned out to be unresponsive to claims of recognition and desire of empowerment. The intention, therefore, here today is to consider the other side of the coin in order to imagine a new normative approach for addressing what we consider to be the main inadequacies of Canadian federalism in its post-patriation era. We seek to sketch a set of criteria for a federalism that is pluralistic in the sense that it can be endorsed from various philosophical and normative positions. We go on to explain how Canadian federalism has failed to satisfy such criteria based on a pluralistic set of values and claims, especially with respect to the place of Quebec in Canada. Indeed, the unfolding of the, the unfolding constitutional order has been stubbornly unresponsive to the expression of Quebec identity's claim and yet prone to centralizing drifts and a monistic focus on functional efficacy at the expense of other federal values. As a result, we argue that Canadian Federation has repeatedly creaked and grown under the pressure of complex diversity. We developed the point that recognition too often times lead to an unhealthy preoccupation, this may surprise some of you, with a push and pull dynamic at the expense of thinking about and working towards a better way to doing things. As an alternative to the emphasis on recognition, we advocate a substantive approach inspired by the idea of federalism of empowerment. At the most abstract and general level, federalism entails some combination of rule and self-rule. We can define federation then as those polities that combine elements of shared rules and self-rule through at least two territorial orders of government constituting distinct but also overlapping political community, each of which is endowed with distinct if sometimes overlapping powers and obligations. Political theorists, politicians, public servants have sought to advance federalism in terms of multiple and sometimes contradictory goals. Generally speaking, normative arguments for federalism tend to appeal to one of three overarching purposes. The first one is the utilitarian conception of federalism that people like Albert Breton or Tom Courchain have been using, or the liberal conception that had been used by Daniel Weinstock, or the third one being the democratic communitarian conception of federalism that people like Will Kemlicka, James Tully, and Guy Laforet have evocated. In the first category called these utilitarian conception of federalism are those arguments that justify federalism as a means for maximizing general utility, uh, 
In this case, federalism promotes efficiency through inter-jurisdictional competition within the context of a common economic market. Presuming that individuals are reasonably mobile, federalism allows individuals to move and settle in those jurisdictions that offer them the best deal or the preferred bundle of public goods. Here you recognize Albert Breton's type of position. As a second category of normative arguments for federalism called these liberal conception, and this emphasizes federalism as a check against the abuse of central power. And Quebecers have always been offended by this type of strategy. What unites this conception is the idea that the chief virtue of federalism is that it prevents the concentration of power in one place. Within the liberal conception, another strain of argument, perhaps more influential than the first one, sees the chief rationale for federalism in counterbalancing governments against one another. This argument featured prominently in the Federalist paper. Our colleague Jacob Levy at McGill is the one that probably has defended and developed that notion most uh, successfully. Then it takes me to the third category of federalism theory, that is the, the, the theory of the conception of democratic communitarian conception. In this case, federalism is understood primarily in terms of collective self-government. That means that federalism sees, is seen as a means of enhancing the voice of the various communities. Therefore, many, many people will look at federalism here as a vehicle for minority self-government in plural societies. This is, I think, what we need to advocate in this country. The ultimate culmination of this line of argument is the notion of full-fledged multinational federation where one or more constituent units is empowered as a locus of national allegiance and as an instrument of collective action in its own rights, even though it continues to participate in the all-encompassing state, giving sense here to the notion of mutual trust. Naturally, some goals or value would be more important to some citizen and political communities than they would be to others. A democratic communitarian concern for minority self-government, for example, will be especially relevant for policies that are characterized by competing nationalism. The way in which we might prioritize utilitarian concern over democratic communitarian concern, for example, may itself already presuppose one particular vision of the political community. Or as Richard Simon puts it, and I quote, terms like efficiency and effectiveness or coordination always contain the implicit for whom and in whose highs. So in the, in the paper here, we try to advance a meta theory of federalism, and we think that both relativism and cynicism can and ought to be resisted. I think this is what comes out in, in our paper, even though they, at times they are good reason to despair. In order to do so, we need to develop a kind of theory a theory how the various values and function of federalism can be brought together and pursued concurrently within the same policies. To this end, and in light of the patriation of 1982, we hope to identify a few key operational principles for the realization of a truly pluralistic federation. The first principle is flexibility. Flexibility is the capacity to change in relation to changing condition to accommodate change while respecting the environment. For our purpose, Flexibility means that the federal balance between shared rule and self-rule can adapt to an evolving environment. This, in fact, goes back to Louise Mendel's presentation. The second principle is robustness. Robustness is the capacity not to change when conditions change, a capacity of self-maintenance, self-adjustments, self-organization in the face of change. Robustness requires that the federal character of the state be preserved throughout successive adaptation. One of the reasons robustness is important is that it is necessary, a necessary supplement to flexibility. Without robustness, a, fit, a flexible federal system may become so decentralized that the benefits of coordination are lost, or so centralized that it creates uh, a federation in all but name. The principle of robustness demands that the federal nature of the state persists regardless of how the federal balance evolves. And here we see the, the influence definitely of someone like André Burel, who is a discrete actor in this type of reasoning. The third principle we advance is versatility by opposition to them. Rather, the point is that no one stands and value as a monopoly on the meaning of federalism. This is especially important in the Canadian context, where the sense of membership in the Canadian Federation is mediated by a plurality of ways of belonging, a plurality of narratives. 
Federalism ought to be prime, prime, uh, prime, uh, prismatic. It should be able to reflect the full spectrum of ways of belonging that are meaningful to people. Taken together, these three principles, flexibility, robustness, versatility, provide a standard against which actual federal system might be appraised. From a democratic standpoint, the best way to realize these three principles, we argue, is along the line of the federalism of empowerment. A federalism viewed as empowerment is an approach that has been championed in the United States by, by Erwin Chemerinsky. Instead of saying federalism as a set of rules limiting power, federalism as empowerment seeks to maintain an open space in which multiples of the government may or may not move in response to changing needs. The notion of federalism as empowerment has strong relevance for the Canadian context. Although, Canada it tends to, although in Canada it tends to cut against the centralizing ambition of the federal government. If policy is dictated from the center, then the constituent units are at risk of being reduced to mere branches of the central government. And this sort of field station federalism precludes effective interjurisdictional competition. Similarly to argument made by, by uh, Jacob Levy, federalism can only act as a bulwark against tyranny if each community is sufficiently empowered as an independent locus of legitimate authority. This applies to Quebec, but equally to Newfoundland, as it does to Alberta. Finally, from the national perspective of Quebec, the potential benefits of federalism as empowerment are substantial and correspond to the redistribution of power to the Quebec state in accordance with its needs and obligation as a modern pluralistic society. Now, for structural reasons, the Canadian Federation is currently ill-equipped to secure the balance of federal interest. The Supreme Court is appointed by the federal government with no input from Quebec or the other provinces, either directly from the provincial government themselves or indirectly by way of a second chamber that is representative of regional and or plurinational interests. This much was recognized as early as the 1956 by the Royal Commission on Inquiry on Constitutional Problem, referring here to the Tremblay Commission. Now, in the second section, and the time is, uh, is going fast, uh, I see this, this clock looks like I'm having been allotted a bit uh, less time, but that's fine. Um, federalism, I, I, we discuss it as being under severe stress. Uh, we, we put the untitled as the unraveling of federalism or the impoverishment of federalism. This is yours to determine which term you prefer. There are three sections to this, uh, to this segment. One is about when rigidity trumps flexibility. The second one is when centralization trumps robustness. The third one is when monism trumps versatility. So in fact, we're trying to take the various points to try to take on the, the principle we have identified at the outset. So prior to the early 1990, uh, prior to the early 1960, the Constitution Act of 1867 was generally seen in Quebec as a bulwark against the centralization ambition of the federal government. However, the rapid ascent of a self-confident, secular, and territorially based Quebec nationalism in the 1960s changed matter in a very considerable way. This movement sought to rethink the term of confederation. All the groups that were active on the Quebec political scene in this period perceived the relationship between the demands of the new socioeconomic role of the state and the need for the provincial government to have a certain minimum of constitutional power. This minimum requires more than the powers granted to the provinces in the Constitution, and definitely more than what was considered to them by, the, by federal constitutional practices, according to Yvan Bernier and André Lajoie. Quebecers would come to see the original Constitution of 1867 not as a, as a guarantee of autonomy, but an, as an obstacle, a break on Quebec dynamism, and a major weakness in the legal system. It is now the case and has been for some time that the vast majority of Quebecers look to the Quebec state as a primary institutional nexus of solidarity and the appropriate medium for the pursuit of a distinct nation building project with wide ranging socioeconomic and cultural ambition. The rise, maturation, institutionalization of Quebec nationalism has arguably been the single most important change in the political environment of Canadian federalism during the last 100 years. The patriation of the Canadian Constitution in 1982 was an opportunity to formally amend the federal arrangement in a way that recognizes the reality of Quebec nationalism. The opportunity was squandered. Rather than, rather than recognizing the reality of Quebec, the settlement of 1982 represents, in many respects, 
a stubborn reaction, as argued by Donald Smalley and Inno and Cheer. Most importantly, the settlement was imposed behind the backs of Quebec representatives and not 20 minutes earlier or later. This independent, of, this independent of the actual substantive content of the settlement, the Constitution Act of 1982 in itself constitutes a denial that there is anything constitutionally significant about Quebec distinctiveness. In addition, the substantive content of the settlement subsumed the national reality of Quebec within a vision of a coast-to-coast -coast bilingualism, a multicultural mosaic, a pan-Canadian constitutional patriotism center in the Charter of Rights and Freedom. James Tully has studied the, that constitutional moment, and he came to the conclusion that the Constitution Act of 1982 put Quebec in a double lock position. Here is what he had to say. Quote, when the National Assembly seeks to preserve and enhance Quebec's character as a modern, predominantly French-speaking society, it finds that its traditional sovereignty in this area is capped by a charter in terms of which all of its legislation must be phrased and justified, but from, but from which any recognition of Quebec distant character has been completely excluded. The effect of the charter, he adds, is thus to assimilate Quebec to a pan-Canadian national culture, exactly what the 1867 Constitution, according to Lord Watson, was designed to prevent." End of quote. Considering this inflexibility and the unraveling of federal practices in Canada, it should not be too surprising that Quebecers questioned the relation within the Canadian polity. In brief, the path of a formal constitutional amendment recognizing and accommodating the national reality of Quebec has been blocked for the last several decades, and so the Canadian Federation has, in this respect at least, failed to satisfy the principle of constitutional flexibility. Naturally, formal constitutional change is not the only possible way of satisfying flexibility. Absent a formal amendment to the letter of the law, the Constitution might be adapted to the reality of Quebec nationalism by means of judicial decision. In other words, the Supreme Court could take the lead and reinterpret the Constitution in multinational and plurinational terms, affecting the otherwise elusive recognition and accommodation of Quebec. This is actually not a radical move, at least not as radical as it might seem to some. In keeping with this approach, we should point out that the federal balance of power has been adjusted by judicial interpretation in response to imperative of a modern industrial social democracy on several occasions. Just to name a few here. To accommodate new technologies, Toronto Corporation versus Bell Telephone Company of Canada. To regulate business uh, activity, General Motors of Canada versus City National Leasing. To expand the power over employment insurance in light of the increased participation of women in the labor market. Here we're referring to the employment insurance. To reflect contemporary norms about the institution of marriage, and so on and so forth. But every time the Supreme Court used those claims, used those cases, they in fact consolidated the central government position. In the same-sex marriage, the Supreme Court expanded the rationale behind the living tree approach to constitutional interpretation, and I quote, a large and liberal or progressive interpretation ensures that the continued relevance and indeed legitimacy of Canada's continuing document, constituting document, by way of progressive interpretation, our constitution succeeds in its ambition enterprise, that of structuring the exercise of power by the organs of the state in times vastly different from those in which it was crafted, end of quote. It is ironic then that the progressive interpretation, it is ironic then that the progressive interpretation has overwhelmingly been used to expand the power of the federal government. Now you have to read the text by colleagues like Catherine Swinton. While the greatest challenge to the legitimacy of the Constitution, that is the reality of Quebec nationalism, has been effectively ignored by the Supreme Court of Canada. It's not as though the opportunity to recognize the national reality of Quebec has never been presented before the court. We could look here at the objection concerning the, uh, the Quebec, uh, uh, the objection to, by Quebec to a resolution to amend the Constitution, the veto reference. We could look at the, the, uh, the following discussion that has been taking place after the depatriation, and so on and so forth. Now, I have to skip a fair amount of the uh, discussion here with respect to the session a secession reference, it builds on, on this uh, interpretation 
uh, that I was uh, mentioning at the very outset, two minutes and 22 seconds. I'll pass, I'll have to skip toward the conclusion. I have a copy of the text if some of you want to read it in full. Um, conclusion. We call it the recognition of the identity debate versus the empowerment of the federal deficit debate. We tried in this paper to show, the, to show that in large part due to the process put in place by the patriation, the Canadian Federation has some major deficiencies and that it has failed to respect the principle of flexibility, robustness, and versatility. We have also seen, to a large extent, that these deficiencies generally stem from the patriation of 1982. Such deficiencies are not without consequences. In a nutshell, flexibility was compromised in a missed opportunity to adapt the Federation to the national reality of Quebec. Subsequently, the robustness of the Quebec federalism has been further eroded by centralizing efforts of the federal government. In addition, the Supreme Court has undermined the versatility of the Canadian Federation by over expanding a ut utilitarian jurisprudence emphasizing functional efficiency at the expense of other federal values, and this is condemnable. We would like to conclude this rather grim assessment of the Canadian Federalism with some thoughts on how things might be improved. Since the patriation of the Constitution in 1982, this question has attracted a good deal of attention from scholars both inside and outside of Quebec. Because the constitutional settlement was premised on a failure or refusal, or refusal to acknowledge the distinctive national reality of Quebec, scholarly criticism has often focused on the question of recognition. We agree that recognition, or lack thereof, is a crucial element in the story. But we want to sound a cautionary note about the dominant focus on recognition. This discourse of recognition, per se, may actually have negative consequences in theory and in practice. At the level of normative theory, and especially with respect to a certain school of normative theory that make rec recognition the issue in how these relations between national major majorities and national minorities are conceptualized, there is a danger of fetishizing recognition, of elevating symbolism and idealizing perpetual dialogue, while sidelining what are arguably more important concrete question of power and power relations. Indeed, this is where Albertans, no fund lenders, I believe, until last night, and Quebecers come closer together with the Canadian federal project. The precise significance of recognition is ambiguous. Is recognition a means to an end, or is the struggle for recognition valuable regardless of the outcome? James Tully seems to suggest the latter. He described the intersubjective activity of struggling over recognition as an intrinsic public good, and the continuing, continuous contests of mutual disclosure and acknowledgement as an ends in themselves. What is the actual benefit for minority nationalists? Tully argues that participation in the intersubjective negotiation of identity, the security of these processes of identity formation, and the acknowledgement, recognition, and respect of these by others are the prerequisite of the sense of self-worth of individuals and groups which empowers them to become free, equal, and autonomous agents in both private and public life. In light of this argument presented here, and to conclude, and to really conclude, we see two dangers in Tully's understanding of the issue. First, despite his emphasis on egalitarian dialogue, the relationship between the partisans in his agonic games remains vertical. They are those who are in a position to benevolently bestow recognition, and they are those who seek it. In other words, this is not a game between two evenly matched teams. This is not the game, let's say, between the Eskimo against the Alouette. Played on the even field according to impartial rule, rather it is a contest where one team has a numerical advantage and rides the rule of the game as it goes to serve its own interest. The second danger is that if we think of the dialogue of recognition as an end in itself, then we as theorists, social scientists, jurists, and citizens may abandon the tough work of actually thinking through the problem of national pluralism in substantive terms. We need more than sporting enthusiasm for agonic games. We need to be able to articulate a substantive vision of what the end games ought to look like. For this reason, we need to move beyond recognition, which is in any case still tied to vertical power dynamics we need to move to a multinational federalism of empowerment 
a federal vision in which different national communities are equipped with the powers they need to flourish, to develop legitimate contexts of choice, and to realize comparable possibilities. Were we to achieve this and to put Roy Romano's statement in its proper context, when we honor our past, we enrich our present. Thank you very much. We have about uh, five minutes for questions, and if you could come to this microphone and indicate whether you're addressing your question to Neil or Alain or to both. Mary Lou? Good morning, Mary Lou McFedrin. I want to thank both Neil and Alain for um, wonderful presentations. My question is to you, Neil. I'm hoping you can just fill in a little bit, middle, maybe the beginning of the third week. What happened then? What happened in that last week leading up to the vote on December 2nd where there was the insertion? Um, uh, four months ago, I was in Ottawa uh, doing a presentation in which there were going to be questions and answers afterward. I was three minutes from finishing, and this hearing aid went. I was one minute from finishing, and this one went. I had a hard time hearing your question. I'm very sorry. Uh, my hearing aids are working, but across the... Uh, so I'm very sorry. That last, is this better, or should I come up? <clears throat> okay. That last week, um, you talked about some of the challenges of bringing together the different organizations. And in that last week in November, what actually happened to bring together a, a singular position? What, what were the dynamics internally that we couldn't see or know um, from in the last week of November until we had a deal that was formalized on December 2nd. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, the, um, the three national organizations and um, the MNC wasn't necessarily that involved at that point apart from with Alberta, but the three national leaders uh, saw the need for getting together. Uh, it was a, a huge challenge. They uh, were meeting. Uh, I think part of the, the uh, uh, impetus for getting together was occasioned by um, Prime Minister Trudeau promising and then not delivering. And um, there were meetings going on behind the scenes. There were meetings uh, with uh, federal officials. Uh, Ed Broadbent played a huge role in that entire process of working with Aboriginal people, letting us know what was happening and going back and forth. And I, I, it was a time when we recognized the need to actually uh, try to be on one page at the highest level as Aboriginal leaders. And it wasn't, I wasn't as involved in that process as um, our national chief and, and uh, the leaders of the ICNI, John Amawalek, uh, Charlie Watt, uh, Mark Gordon, and a very brilliant man who played a big role, uh, Harry Daniels, charismatic, and, but uh, working on it. So those were the main dynamics is uh, the fear, uh, the, the genuine, the real fear that, we, that the provinces and the premiers were not going to uh, there was no reason to trust them. They were uh, flip-flopping and did again as well. So that's the main point that, that I understand. Thank you. I also have a question for you, Neil. Um, we've heard about how uh, the very, there was a clear lack of participation by Aboriginal peoples in the formal uh, constitutional negotiations in 1981. I'd like to move forward um, to the Charlottetown constitutional negotiations, and you and I both participated in those, and you were reminding me yesterday of um, 
the way in which you were assigned the role you performed, which you performed very well, I must say. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on, just briefly describe that role and how it came about and um, indicate what you think of the uh, process and the degree of Aboriginal participation and do you see that that, that um, process would be a good model for future constitutional negotiations? Uh, thank you. Yes, what happened by the time we got, uh, I was heavily involved with the Assembly of First Nations in uh, 1983, 84, 85, and 87. When the Charlottetown Accord process came along, uh, the federal government and the provincial governments appointed two co-chairs to uh, chair the Aboriginal ministerial official and, and officials meetings. Uh, I think they had a meeting in Toronto and um, and at that meeting, all four national Abor Ab Aboriginal organizations, the MNC, ICNI, um, AFN, and uh, the Métis, uh, or National Council of Canada, they rebelled. They said, there's no way we're going through this process without an Aboriginal person sitting up there co-chairing these meetings. So the uh, four national organizations spent about a week talking back and forth, and at the end of that process, uh, they asked um, whether, I, I believe it was by then Phil Fontaine, but I'm not positive. No, no, not for that. It was Ovid Mercury, who was the national chief. And in any event, um, the four national organizations uh, asked me to co-chair the, uh, the officials and ministerial uh, sessions uh, leading up to the Charlottetown Accord. Um, the... The, the process, actually it's interesting you ask that question because uh, Joe Clark uh, about three months ago or two months ago uh, phoned um, Scott Serson who was one of the co-chairs for the feds and then there was a New Brunswick person and I don't recall his name but he phoned uh, Scott and asked him whether he would put down the process because he thought it was such a good model that he could use in, with the, in, in doing a lot of work overseas. And Scott phoned me and said, uh, could we get together and define what worked in that process? Um, uh, yes, I, I would say it's a good model uh, because um, by the time we got to the Charlottetown Accord, there was a real willingness, by the way, on the part of the federal government for sure, and perhaps many provincial governments, to uh, come up with a, um, a, a process for self-government. And there was, um, at the end of that, Prime Minister Moroni was very disappointed. I had phone calls afterwards. Uh, how are we going to re cover this now that the Aboriginal people in the referendum have said no. And um, in any event, it was a good process. Here to me was the weakness. And it's the same thing that you're talking about in terms of Quebec and everything else. The weakness in any constitutional process is leaving the people out. What we ended up having to do, and I was one of them, and there were other leaders in other provinces and the territories going out and trying to educate the communities about we, what we were, had achieved uh, through negotiation uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the ministerial, or the officials ministerial and FMC. And we just couldn't deliver. People were, didn't know, they weren't involved, and it was difficult. So there's a weakness. You can't leave one person out. They have to be involved. So I, uh, that answers part of your question. It doesn't answer all of it. I think, it, I think it's a good process. We have just one more question very, very quickly, and then we will break for a coffee. Elaine, I'm grateful for your presentation. For me, it leaves us looking to the future instead of reminiscing about the past. Um, for, for my personal interest, my grandchildren don't know if their first language is French or English. I'm unilingual English. At any rate, um, you mentioned three basic models, as I understood it, and it seemed to me that you seem to think we need to make a choice between the models instead of looking to a blending of those models. Secondly, um, you suggested a number of principles. The European community, as I understand it, looks at the principles of subsidiarity and harmonization. 
uh, subsidiarity being a way of dividing powers where you look at what can best be done by the uh, European Union as a whole and what can best be done at the local level and then try and sort that out. I didn't hear those principles uh, included in the principles that you listed. Oh, one more point. I'd like a copy of your paper if I can be first in line for that. Yeah, well, uh, obviously I have a preference in those models. Uh, the one that have a communitarian base, uh, democratically communitarian base is the one that I do privilege in a federation. The question is that do we have a federation or don't we have a federation? Uh, if we do have one, it has to have meaning. Uh, if we are living in a unitary state, well, then uh, the, the rules are very different. But we try to transform the federation in a way that does not pay that much attention to, I would say, deep diversity. Uh, with respect to the Quebec case, I think this is very obvious, and this is where we need to redress that. And I was suggesting that perhaps uh, short of uh, always moving toward constitutional means by which we can modify the Constitution, there are non-constitutional means that we can use. The Supreme Court is one of those, but we will need to appoint judges that are much more sensitive to claims made by regions, and by sub-nations within the country. Uh, and so far, we have not, uh, we failed to do that. Um, we should give a role to the Senate also that is compatible with these claims. Uh, for instance, uh, people not named, not appointed because they are connected with the party uh, and because they bring money to the party, but because they have something, they have interests to represent community interest to represent, I think Canadian would be much better served serve if we were to do that instead of appointing bag men to the party and to the Senate. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Alain. Um, thank uh, Peter, and I'd like to thank Neil and Alain for a wonderful morning. We have about 10, 15 minutes for a coffee, and then we can return. So please uh, join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>